Welcome to KDH Collective's Neuropod, a journey where we delve into the intricate world of neurodivergence within the therapy room. Join Katie Holmes, a licensed professional counselor with 16 years of experience, and Erica Thibodeau, a seasoned licensed professional clinical counselor, as they wholeheartedly share their extensive expertise, personal encounters, and therapeutic insight. Our aim is to foster greater understanding and appreciation for this remarkable population. Hey, everyone. In this episode, we are going to share about ourselves as clinicians, as well as tell you our personal neurodivergent stories. We will explain our mission for this podcast and talk about why we think it's important for therapists to know this information. And I'll just jump in since I'm the one talking right now. This is Erica. Um, a little bit about my background. I love to focus in my work as a therapist at the intersection of mental health and actually ecology. I love what nature teaches me and, and shows me about being alive in the animate world. I graduated with a bachelor's degree in architecture, and then I went on to volunteer in the Peace Corps in West Africa with the Dagra tribe. I was fortunate to study with an, an apprentice with a Dagra elder, Maladoma Somain, and those experiences heavily informed how I approach therapy. I use a somatic approach, and I stay very curious about each unique person walking in the door. So I feel like I bring these two lenses, this, this clinical training, along with this training with an elder who really opened my mind to, for me, what it is to be human and walking in the world. And it's interesting because my neurodivergence story is that I had a fantastic clinical supervisor who really specialized in neurodivergence. I got trained in early intervention um, in this program called the Play Project. And I started working with families and I missed a lot of symptoms. I missed a lot of behaviors. I missed a lot of examples of neurodivergence because I was truly blinded by my own neurodivergence. And it was six years into my clinical practice that I really went to my mentor who, who was no longer my supervisor, but she was still my, my mentor. And I actually still meet with her. Um, and just started asking hard questions about myself, which she had always been so professional about and never, never brought me into the room, <laughs> but there, I would be like meeting with a family about their 13 year old and be like, Oh yeah, that's typical. I think typical. Yeah. That's just being 13. You know, we're trying to like sort out like what, what is their neurodivergence? What is this, this person had autism? What is, you know, just being a 13 year old. And, um, over the years, I just felt like I related so much and it is kind of a joke. And I think we'll hear this from both of us, Katie, you know, there, there is a thing when you're a clinician that you start to ask yourself, do I have this? Am I, do I have this diagnosis? Do I have these symptoms? Because what our vocabulary explains is, you know, what our diagnostic vocabulary is, is a, a language that providers can use to communicate with each other. So it's often describing human beings. Um, but with this particular, with with autism, I really feel like I could not see the forest for the trees because I was like standing inside of it. And on the flip side though, I, over time, not meaning to, because this working with that early intervention program was a, a small percentage of my caseload. Without meaning to, I ended up with a caseload full of either people with neurodiversity, often undiagnosed adults, someone whose spouse or child or partner had neurodiversity with or without a diagnosis. And this neurodivergent person was really struggling and either causing a lot of strain in the family because no one knew how to support them. Um, there were a lot of unmet needs, a lot of missed communication because this, it just, they weren't fully understood. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I just ended up with this caseload full of support for neurodivergent people. And through that journey started to un 
unfold my own story. And I'm still in process of that, honestly. You know, it's, I, I love how our field is opening to neurodivergence mm -hmm. and Katie and I are so passionate about it. Um, but that is kind of where, where my story led me was like opening up to my own, my own neurodivergence that had, that made sense when I looked back over the course of my life mm -hmm. and started, I am still unpacking my own sensory needs, my own sensory profile, my, the ways that my way of being interferes with my interpersonal relationships. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it's a lot to unpack. And I think some of it will come out in our, in our storytelling and in our sharing about ourselves as clinicians and in sharing the information, there's just so much great information that both Katie and I have uncovered as we've worked with this population that feels so important at this particular time to support people coming in the door. Okay. I'm going to pass over to you. Well, and I love that because I think we've been friends. So me and Erica have been friends for a really long time. My work name is KD, but my name is Keisha. Um, it's just kind of how I take ownership for my business because it's KDH Counseling, KDH Collective. So I'll say I'm KD, but my name is Keisha. Um, me and Erica have been friends for years and we have been eternally, eternally curious about different topics. And so I was greatly impacted when she started to identify with her own autism because I'm so much like her. So I was like, what does this mean for me? Right. Um, and that started a whole unraveling of things that I'll explain my own curiosity about where I fall into this. So I have a private practice in Lafayette, Louisiana. Um, I've been a therapist for 16 years. I love what I do. I was made for this uh, in so many ways. Uh, my undergrad's in anthropology, and that greatly impacts how I am as a therapist. There are a thousand ways to do the same thing. And you realize that when you're in anthropology, because there's a thing called ethnocentrism, where you think your way is the only way or the right way. But that's just a natural cultural phenomenon, but it doesn't mean it's right. It's just different. And so I think that kind of thinking comes into my work. Uh, so I am ADHD. That is my neurodivergence. I did not know that I was or hadn't really identified it or owned it until Erica started sharing about autism and I went down the rabbit hole. I don't have autism. I'm probably so close though. If it's two circles that overlap, I'm probably like right next to where I would, um, but I'm definitely ADHD. And I think when I started embracing that, I understood myself even more and I started to realize how much it has affected my life since I was a child and the way people had difficulty parenting me, um, which I don't think is difficult, but that's a common thing. And then as I grew up, like I, I couldn't understand things socially because of the way my brain functioned. I was always slow, right, to the table. Uh, other people understood things, but my brain couldn't differentiate it. And so it's part of how my brain functions. It's just how I work. I understand it a lot more now and I accept myself a lot more, but think as this experience was happening where I was owning my own neurodivergence and then Erica is owning hers, I'm also getting these clients who are on the spectrum, undiagnosed adults. Um, I'm starting to understand more of how it's happening in my office as well. So it's these multiple lens, like I'm looking at myself through the lens, and then I'm using that lens in my clinical practice, which creates this awareness in a weird sort of way. I, I can't explain it because it's like you are the, the patient, but you're also the clinician. So it gives you just so much more understanding and compassion. Uh, I think it's a very common thing in our office and it gets like we don't look at it through that lens as therapists, we look at it through mental health and there is overlap, but I think that it comes from the biology, the neurology of who we are. You're not changing that. You can do whatever you want, who you are neurologically, I think is who you are. And so a lot of this, this movement, I love because it's about accepting who we are. And that some, seems very natural and authentic. Um, I just recently did, I specialize in trauma and I just recently did a trauma presentation and I realized coming out of it that I am very much about the body. So this is where me and Erica will like 
but we bounce off of each other a lot about somatic approaches and about the wisdom of our bodies. It's not our enemy, it's our friend, and it's actually wiser than us. And if we take that same kind of understanding and we start looking at neurology, so then what's in that, right? It, everything's not a pathology or a wrongness. Um, I know that's hard for people to hear if you're struggling mentally, but there is a certain amount of honoring that you're going to have to get to, to find your way through it or to, to cope. I don't even know the right word for it. Uh, so I'm really excited. I'm very passionate about this subject. We constantly, when we're like questioning each other, coming up with all kinds of stuff, like where does this rabbit hole go? It's been fun for us to, to discover it and to figure it out together because of probably who we are in our long relationship together. So I'm very excited. Yay. Oh, that was beautiful, Keisha. I, as you were sharing, I just kept thinking about um, something that comes up in our curiosity that I think has really informed and our, our practices and our discussions with this is our ability to communicate non-verbally in the therapy room. And so there's so much that I experience somatically that informs what's happening for the other person. I take a lot of cues and I didn't know I was doing this. I didn't know this was anything different, but over the years, having enough people, enough neurodivergent patients or their family members feel seen and understood. And it's just simply because when we have a some basis of understanding from our own lived experience, and it's not exactly the same. And I, I share with you, I feel like I'm like one little hairline away from ADHD. I'm always like, well, is it ADHD? Is it, you know, because there, it's neurological and our brain is complex and there's a lot of overlap. But often people will say, I haven't had a therapist be able to put into words what I'm experiencing before. And I, I think that that has fueled our conversation so much when we see something or we allow something to happen in the therapy room that just hasn't been able to happen for that person before. And it's because we're not trying to fit them into a neurotypical framework that so much of therapeutic treatment has been created around. And I just wanted to give a couple of statistics before we share about like the, some of what we hope to share on this podcast. Um, according to some researchers, approximately 20% of, of the population is neurodivergent. And so those people experience more struggle and mental health concerns because navigating a neurotypical world created around, you know, 80% of the population is just more difficult. And, and it, it does lead to a lot of comorbid diagnoses. So they have neuro, some type of neuro, they're neurodivergent, and then they have other diagnoses along with that for different reasons. Um, but this therapists typically have more neurodivergent people on their caseload than they realize because their struggles are really present navigating the world. And unfortunately, a lot of our training does not pre prepare us to be inclusive of this population in our practices. So we're trained to work in a neurotypical landscape. Um, we learn words, methods, interventions, and language that's neurotypical in its expression. And um, this mode of therapy doesn't translate well to neurodivergent folks. And so Keisha and I have embarked on an exciting journey the last several years of just sharing information, ideas back and forth. Um, Keisha is doing incredible work in her clinical training business and the where she offers courses. And so this podcast, and I, I want to pass it to you in just a second, is is a space where we can begin to share some of these in-depth conversations and clinical curiosities, expertise, practices, trial and error, just all that we wonder about and spend a lot of our waking hours reading, thinking, studying, teaching about. We want to share it in a more accessible way, which is through this podcast. Definitely. And I'm so I'm curious in that study, 
because I'm thinking there probably are a lot of people on the autism spectrum undiagnosed, a lot of people with ADHD undiagnosed. I wonder if the statistics are higher. Mm -hmm. And I wonder exactly what neurodivergent things they were testing for in that 20%. Because neurodiversity or neurodivergence includes, I mean, it's pretty broad, mm -hmm. ADHD, autism, uh, OCD, trauma, um, learning differences. So any learning difference, I mean, that's mm -hmm. a lot. Normally they call them learning disabilities. I just don't like the word disability. So instead of like dysfunction or disability, I just say difference because I, I don't think that we should be perpetuating this is the norm, like this is the road of normal because we're setting people up in the way that you said for this neurotypical expectation that's impossible for them to achieve. So then in therapy, they're failing, right? Mm -hmm. It needs to be a broad path, path that includes differences. I mean, I'm thinking back to the days when people that were hearing that couldn't hear and that you they would sign that they were considered not smart. I was watching mm -hmm. something recently that made me think about that and how much, how much more we know now that that's not the case. It has nothing to do with that. And so I'll hear stories of people who, who can't speak and have autism and then they get a device and they start sharing mm -hmm. all these beautiful things about their struggle. Mm -hmm. And like, so they're capable of what, and it, that's even a weird word to say, but I think the way that we look at things is in this very narrow norm neurotypical mm -hmm. way and it's part of the problem it really mm -hmm. is part of the problem so then we're who knows if these diagnoses are really diagnosis really you know it gets me in a whole nother rabbit hole but I think we just want people to start being curious about it and that's what we have been trying to uncover like what is the best way to help these populations the most efficient way if we include the, their body and if we include these neurological differences, what would we do different? Because traditional therapy, somebody comes in with social anxiety, no one's looking for autism. It's not always the case, but sometimes it's it could be autism. It could also be a um, sensory sensitivity to sound light that creates this anxiety. And if we do traditional methods, we might not be helping the person. Mm -hmm. Uh, not that what we do is bad, but we're just not being efficient. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that it, I'm, I, I think that typically people not seen in therapy, not progressing, not being supported by no fault of the clinician, you know, this is just really not been taught to us. <laughs> you know, we, we, recently in the last 10 years, trauma is what made its way into grad school programs. And that's what people have been getting trained in as a trauma-informed approach. And Keisha and I use trauma-informed approaches. And as we've been working with so many divergent patients, it's really, it's just so eye-opening to shift. And I think both of us um, were because we had to find unique ways to exist in our world and unique ways to excel, I think that that lens and curiosity existed for us. Keisha is an incredible artist. We're both very creative people. I think that that helped us to be situated as clinicians to to stay so curious. And then once we realize like, oh, this is neurodivergence, this is autism, this is ADHD. This is, I mean, really a big one has been looking for autism in the therapy room, looking for the unseen situation that's at the foundation of the, this person's struggles that's informing everything else, you know, but it's at, it's like the basis of all of the struggles and, and then supporting this person from the place, exactly what you said from their biology and from their neurology and some of what is emerging in our field and our world is really helping them to identify appropriate accommodations and support to, to exist in a world that is, is not created with them in mind, you know? Um, and I see our world changing every day too, you know? Agreed. Agreed. There is hope. 
So what is the name of that book? It's uh, Divergent, Divergent Minds. Minds. Yes. Yeah. Living in a world not made for us. I mean, that, that title, it just says it all. Like when you were talking just now, that's the title I heard. I'm like, yep. Oh, I love that. Um, as we unravel this, I think we're going to try to cover as many subjects as we can. And for people that don't know how our brain works, or both of our brains, uh, we will say some topics. I'm pretty sure once we get into it, there will be more rabbit holes down this one rabbit hole that we're kind of looking at, but because that's what happens. We get curious and we start figuring something out and then we follow that. Um, so, but to start off with, we're going to cover sensory profiles and differences, which is one of my favorite topics. I think it has been the most impactful for me as a therapist in helping people. Uh, I'm really curious. We're going to do a deep dive on this one, like all the sensory differences, uh, the way they can be seen. We're going to, we're going to look at it a bunch of different ways. Do you want to say anything about that, Erica? I think that sensory profiles, understanding someone's sensory needs and differences can really support them in all of their relationships and in understanding themselves, their themselves, because so often they will be in a fight or flight state just because of a sensory sensitivity and we can help them cope better no. with, once we understand that better. I can't well, not wait to dive into that. Well, I'm even thinking of sound sensitivities linked to anger outbursts, um, light sensitivities linked to like people feeling burnout and depressed at the end of a day because the lights on them all day. I mean, directly proportional, right? These are things that can be treated. So we're going to explore that. We're going to look at pathological demand avoidance, which I, I, love. I love pathological demand avoidance. Um, the way I like short, it's really more complicated than this, but this is my short little brief description on this. It's when someone has a demand, whether an external one or an internal one, it could be somebody giving you a compliment in the world and you're supposed to say thank you, or it could be a cue for hunger and you're hungry, but you can't decide on what to eat. So you eat nothing. So you will, you will avoid those demands. Uh, and that's like a really brief, but it can be sometimes linked or there's some overlap between that and ODD, oppositional defiance disorder. And so a lot of people are saying it's actually pathological demand avoidance and like ODD isn't a thing or what's your brief description on that, Erica? Yeah, I think the curiosity and especially from my mentor, who is Judith Woods, um, incredible provider up in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, you know, we just kind of question ODD because it is one of those diagnoses that solely looks at a young person, you know, behavior versus the, the, the underlying story of what is the need and what, what is, what is fueling this behavior? And is it an, is it a diagnosis that we haven't identified yet? So I think when ODD is present, I'm always curious about neurodivergence and what is their verbal expression ability? Because oftentimes someone diagnosed with ODD really it starts you know we we have to look at their ability to express their needs is is do they have autism are they on the spectrum what's going on there well and that's me leading me in because I'm thinking like because ODD is such a disruptive like the presentation mm -hmm. of symptoms is not like quiet and sweet right so we give it, it has this connotation of this really negative diagnosis, which is the same mm -hmm. thing for borderline personality disorder, right? Mm -hmm. Borderline, the overlap between borderline and autism is high. And it's mm -hmm. interesting that we give the more like external, externally negative presentations. We give them these diagnoses that nobody, or they get the connotation of a diagnosis that nobody wants to have. It's like these mm -hmm. really the diagnosis itself creates a lot of shame. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just interesting. But if it, if someone's quiet and obedient, they'll just get missed. They could be wanting to die, sensory overload, but they're quiet and sweet. So no one's really bothered by them. It's just, and often that can be autism, right? It can be. It can be ADHD, inattentive subtype. It can be a lot of things. I'm just, it's just interesting to me 
the misunderstanding, I think, Mm -hmm. of mental health, even in this day and age. Mm -hmm. There is a big movement to change this, but there's also uh, a lot of comorbidity. So some people say OCD is a neurodivergent diagnosis, right? Because it's neurological. People with OCD have more gray matter in their brain, but there's also a lot of comorbidity with that and autism. And that maybe an ADHD as well. I'm going to have to look that up, but mm-hmm. I would imagine. Um, so we're going to do some deep dives on that. Mm-hmm. Relationships. Yeah. So relationships, how these things come out in marriages, couples, any sort of relationship. I'm thinking of ADHD girls, the hyperactive subtype. Uh, parents will often be really worried because they struggle in friendships myself mm-hmm. included, uh, when I was younger and they have all this shame, the children for these differences and mm-hmm. they're just different. I mean, often they're so honest. This is where they're kind of like autism. Cause I'll just be like, Hey, I don't like that or that. Oh, mm-hmm. I'm better than you at this. They'll just be honest. And other people are, are concerned or worried when they just see the facts as the facts. There's no emotional attachment to that. Uh, but there's all this shame in our society about it. So we'll do a deep dive in how this shows up in relationships and marriages. The amount of marriages that have something like this going on in it is crazy. Do you see a high number of this? This is just oh, total, but yes. I mean, there are weeks where I start to wonder if I just see everyone as neurodivergent. And I, I think it's just because exactly what I said earlier, the, more people are coming into the office with neurodivergence because they're suffering more. The, 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 there's a struggle there. Not that they're suffering more, but their struggle, they're more often struggling in our neurotypical world. And so that, you know, I, I see so many relationship issues. And yeah. if it's not the person with ADHD or autism coming in the door, it's their spouse coming in because they are struggling so much. Also, I've often, with most personality disorders, um, narcissistic personality disorder, I wonder, you know, when a person is telling me about their spouse or I'll even meet their spouse and I'm like, ah, I am wondering if this is autism. They're not getting the cue. They don't know when to stop talking. They don't get the needs of their partner. They're not, they seem very self-absorbed and it's just very interesting. Also, narcissism is a word that's overly used right now. You know, great to bring these words out into, into the media, but social media can often like overuse trauma and triggers and personality disorder. You know, a lot of therapy speak without the context behind it. So, you know, I think that we'll always be navigating that in this day and age with this type of media, even the podcast. I know, I know. It's beautiful in some ways because it provides so much information that people otherwise would not have had. But then, yeah, the other side of it is you can't really control how that information is presented or even if Mm -hmm. it's factual. That's one of my big, like, you know, I'll get comments Ah, oh, like if I do, um, anytime somebody gets a negative comment on my site, I'm like, ah, oh, you made it. Uh, but like, <laughs> we'll comment on it. Yeah, like that means you're doing a really good job. But we'll comment about like educating people on what exposure and response prevention is, which is the treatment for OCD. And you'll get these really, really intense negative responses. Or I'll talk about what OCD is because its subtypes are bizarre in nature. Um, and that's part of just the nature of OCD. And so, A lot of like, it's awesome that we can get the information out there, but it makes you realize how many people don't understand what this actually is. Mm -hmm. Um, So absolutely, ah, it's a double-edged sword. I wonder if we'll have a different, if it'll look different in a few years or if it'll continue at this pace. Uh, I don't know. Also, we're going to look at trauma as it relates to this stuff because trauma in exacerbates symptoms uh, with ADHD and trauma, there's a lot of symptom overlap, same thing with autism. So it's like, which is which, but I think that trauma makes it worse. And so we're going to do a deep dive on that. 
with each. I think we're, we're really looking at ADHD and autism. We're going to look at some other things, but that's the main things we're focused on in this podcast. But again, who knows where we'll end up. And we're also going to look at like coping and how to like respect these differences, honor them biologically and how to help people cope more effectively. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm excited. I am too. I am too. Mm -hmm. I think so. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I hope everyone will join us on this journey. And, you know, I hope that, that our discussions enhance their clinical discussions with their colleagues and their, um, yeah, just their clinical practices. Well, and my, just for y'all to know my dream for KDH collective is I think that the collective brain is better than the individual, especially for therapy. We are alone in our office for hours and hours and hours every single day. And there is a power differential no matter what you do. We are the experts, you know, and we're trying to help people. And that so there has to be some sort of like reflection, some practice of consulting with other professionals so that you can self-check and be remain open it's mm -hmm. like it's the only way for our practice to remain competent and and good at what we're doing and so mm -hmm. i'm hoping that for through our dialogue because if we do things differently we're going to talk openly about it mm -hmm. i'm hoping that we can show people how i think all therapists should be doing this similar kind of consultation process for anything they're into, because it's so easy to think you're right when you're alone in a room with other people all day long. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I and yeah, I, and you'll, you'll see Keisha and I, and listen to Keisha and I disagree and be curious with each other and question and encourage. I mean, there's just so much that goes back and forth, I think in our discussions and, and Keisha works with a collective. And so their discussions will make their way into this conversation as well. I also have my own consultation group. So I love that we are bringing forth many voices that, you know, that are having these discussions and sharing them here together. I like the idea of many voices, Erica, like the power yeah. of many voices, right? Mm -hmm. How do we stay connected to that? How do we transmit that? And it, I think it's not the voices of power. It's something else that we're trying to facilitate mm -hmm. here because the voice of power is heard pretty easily. It's those other voices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's making me think of melodoma. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it just is. Mm -hmm. I wonder what he would think. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I can say this. One thing that really helped me in my work is how curious he was at every person, you know, that we ever sat with. There was like never a wrong way of being. Everyone was just like a unique form of nature. And it really radiated from him and my other elder and the Dagra people in general. And it woke something up in me before I even went to grad school to be a therapist. I just knew I was like, wow, these people have no material possessions and they are thriving and happy and connected in a way that is so beautiful. I really want to understand this. And I wrote a lot of my grad school papers and did my research on how do we learn from what earth-based people can still teach us about, um, being human together. Erica, I think that's what we want. We want to, we want to learn how to be human together in this neurodivergent kind of way. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the visual I had, I was riding my bike. I always get these images when I ride my bike. It's like a, a net, like when you're weaving underneath and on top, underneath and on top. So you get this net to support, it will probably be this way to support your clients. Right. And it's all this knowledge that we get and we're weaving in and out of. Mm. And so that when people fall in it, they have something that helps them bounce back out. And mm. to me, that's what community is. Mm -hmm. If we do a good job, if we accept someone where they are 
and we do a really good job of teaching or of being a, a mirror for that, we can create that web. That's my mm-hmm. hope. Yes. I love that visual. I'm taking that one. <laughs> All right. Honey. Okay, everyone. Until next time. Bye.